Howdy y'all, welcome back to Little Bits. Today we're gonna to talk a little bit about Small Computer Central, the various computer designs by Stephen C. Cousins. I hope I'm pronouncing your, your last name correctly there, uh, Steve, if you're watching. Um, here is a representation of some of his backplanes that are compatible with the RC bus 80 pin standard. A standard that he is largely responsible for um, although I don't want to give just him credit it's the community um, but he maintains all the documentation about it on his site and uh, yeah it's this is a really good representation of a modern 8-bit compute machine it uses a Zilog 80 uh, he also has Zilog 180 systems which we will also demonstrate today um, but today we're going to look at how to develop firmware for one of these boards uh, using this card here. Among these cards, uh, this one is the firmware developer kit. And it's really interesting because it does something special. This switch here switches between a ROM module and a RAM module. But it... it um, maps both of them to the lower 32k of memory. So while this switch is flipped to flash, you're working off of flash memory. And while it's switched to uh, ROM, you're working off of ROM. So what you can do is you can use the operating environment that's supplied with this system called Small Computer Monitor to upload your own operating system and this is designed in such a way as when it's mapped to flash if you write to the lower 32k it's not writing to flash it's actually writing to ram so then when you flip the switch after writing to the lower 32k you can reset the computer and get yourself a uh get yourself running on whatever you just uploaded and then when you need to you can switch back and go back to your normal firmware and reset. You can see I don't have anything in the memory right now, so you saw it initialize itself here um, when I switched back to flash. We're gonna go ahead and turn the computer off. We'll talk a little bit about each component on here and um, what they do and how we can actually use this device uh, with a modern computer to uh, do development for it to develop our own firmware to develop our own applications to develop our own um, operating systems from the ground up if we really want to which technically when we're talking about firmware we're talking about an operating environment but there's sort of a difference between a firmware and an operating system and that firmware might be single purpose it might be a very specific use case for example small computer monitor is a computer monitor it's not an operating system. It doesn't provide the services of an operating system. Uh, you could certainly bootstrap it up to an operating system with enough skill, but you know, typically by that point, you wanna switch to an operating system, something like CPM or uh, Zeal 8-bit operating system, uh, which we still need to port to this. This one uh, doesn't quite run that one yet, but we'll talk a little bit about the operating systems as well in this video. So. Uh, if you're interested in these 8-bit computers, what they can do, and how you can develop for them, you know, stay tuned. This is the video for you. So let's take a look at some of the components we'll be using today. Now there are more components installed on here than I will be using to demonstrate today, but um, this is my primary kind of development rig, so uh, I'm not really going to remove anything other than what I need to show you. So this is our Zilog SIO module. It actually has its own oscillator on here at 7.3, what is it? 7.3728 megahertz, which is the oscillation speed required to get the standard 115200 baud rate that we are going to use. Now, it's important that this particular module has a its own oscillator to drive the SIO clock if we want to keep the baud rate consistent because we are also using a 
Zilog 80 module that allows for overclocking. Now this has three optional, this has one required and two optional oscillators. You can see this one here is the seven point, um, I always forget the number, 7.3728. I need to memorize that. Uh, that's an important number. So um, we have the optional one here, or we have the required one here, and then there's an optional one down here. I've populated some of the optional footprint, uh, but for this particular model, when you don't have uh, an oscillator populated here, I don't have my oscillator yet. I actually, I do, I have an eight megahertz oscillator I plan to install here. And then, um, I, but I need my capacitors. I don't have these 22 picofarad capacitors. So for this particular board, you can see I have C7 tied with just uh, the leg of a, of a component, one of these components that I soldered on. And that's because this particular model requires that so that you don't leave a certain line floating that can cause problems when, um, when you're operating the system. If this is unpopulated, you just need to populate this with a wire. Later on, I'll remove this, I'll populate the crystal, I'll populate the two capacitors, and I'll be able to switch between all three of these, between the seven point <laughs> 7.3728 and the uh, 10 megahertz and the eight megahertz. Now, right now I'm running at 10 megahertz. You can see I have jumpers here that allow me to select the clock. This bottom jumper connects the CPU clock on this board to the bus system, the back end. So this board actually gives us a lot of options. We can overclock it, we can isolate the clock, drive the rest of the system from a completely different clock if we want to have the CPU doing its own its own speeds if we want to. Um, all sorts of options here, right? But the cool thing about this one is that even though Crystal 2 is unpopulated, I can still use Crystal 3. I just need to make sure that this is tied down so that we don't get unpredictable behavior from a floating pin. I don't know why that is. I just know that the documentation says that's the case. Uh, if I switch this back up to this one, then I will be using the default Crystal. Now you'll remember now, if you'll remember, this one also has its own crystal, right? And so uh, I'm isolating this clock from the rest of the bus. But I could drive the bus with this clock. I think I could from this board. I, I'd have to confirm. Depends on how these jumpers are set. Um, but I could also drive the SIO from this clock if I set these jumpers correctly, right? So I could attach this to the bus as it is, and I could attach this to the bus using these jumpers and... Um, I could drive this at 10 megahertz, for example, but I don't want to drive this at 10 megahertz. I want to drive it at the seven point, uh, memorize it, 7.3728 megahertz, which is going to keep, even though I'm overclocking here, which actually let's make sure we are overclocking, even though I'm overclocking here, it means that I don't have to change the software to ensure that I'm using a different baud rate. Like the baud rate on this is not gonna change because it's using this crystal, even though the even though the timing changed here. So that's cool, right? So there's our, our CPU module and how we have it configured. Now we also have, of course, our memory module. Now for, um, for the small computer central components, typically you will see the ROM and RAM together on a single memory module. Uh, other, like RC2014, the, the my original model that you may have seen me solder together on this channel, uh, it typically separates the RAM and the ROM into separate modules. Uh, typically on this one, you get the same exact functionality as those compacted into more of a single board. They also He also has like a single board computer type model where the CPU, RAM, and ROM are all together on one. Um, there's no overclocking available on that one. Of course, you can do it if you uh, try hard enough, but um, it's not built in like it is with, with this module that we just showed you. Now for this, we want to install our firmware here. And earlier I made a mistake when I was talking about the developer card module. I said when it's flipped to ROM, actually it's RAM, right? So this is ROM, this is RAM, but this is treated as a ROM by the system. So uh, I made a simple mistake there, but in this case, we don't want to actually use this ROM that's installed. We want to use the ROM that's on this board. But the RAM that's on this board is meant to be treated as a ROM, so we still need RAM 
on this board because this is gonna be the upper 32K of RAM. So now what I need to do is I need to pull this chip out if I want to run it alongside this one. Now you'll notice that this is a different bus system, right? This is the RC bus 80 pin standard. And this is the Z50 bus 50 pin standard. Now I have a board here that is also from Small Computer Central. This is one of the back planes. This one's really useful for uh, developing for both bus systems because it connects both bus systems and it keeps their connections consistent between them. Um, they're pretty much 100% compatible with each other. With some exceptions, the fact of the matter is that the RC bus 80 pin standard has a bunch of extra pins that are not used for Z80. Uh, some of them might be used for Z180, I don't know yet. Uh, but there's up to 24 address pin lines on here, which are unused by Z80 uh, the, beyond the 16th. And there's up to uh, 16 bits of data. There's 16 data lines on here. So this bus system is designed for forwards compatibility with different, or multiple compatibilities with different um, CPU architectures. So if I built a card around, instead of a Zilog, if I built a card around something that was a 16-bit card or a 24-bit um, card, or maybe I wanted a Z, an easy 80, which has a 24-bit address addressing mode called ADL, uh, advanced or addressing data long mode. And so um, there's a lot of flexibility to expand into different computer architectures on this bus. Whereas with the Z50 bus, it is designed for Z80, Z180. It's not designed for anything beyond that. It handles Z80 and it handles Z180. It's not going to be able to be extended out into uh, you know, easy 80, at least not easily, and it's not going to be able to be extended out into things like 32-bit architectures for certain. So, um, although this is mostly going to be supporting, although this bus is mostly going to be supporting 8-bit and 16-bit architectures uh, with its 24-bit limitation on the, on the, but there are also, it also has additional uh, optional user ports that you could extend the address space or data space even further if you wanted to, but not up to 32 bits of each. So, you know, it's it's limited, but it's a lot less limited than um, the Z50 bus, and it's significantly less limited than its predecessors, the RC2014 bus um, and the RC2014 extended bus, which is pretty awesome. It is compatible with those ones, though. So you could plug one of these modules into an older RC bus, RC2014, 40 pin standard, even the, the original 40 pin standard, half the pins, and these will still work on that bus system. So it's backwards compatible and everything. Um, yeah, so that's a lot, a lot of information there. Uh, but these are the components we're going to be using. Now we do want to remove that memory module. We want to remove this component from the memory module. And I'm going to do that off screen so I don't risk breaking it or knocking over the camera. I have a chip extractor here to make sure I don't bend the pins. I got it out safely. Sometimes I still bend the pins. Uh, I've had to bend them back a couple times. So now you see we have this unpopulated. If I were to plug this in without uh, anything else but the CPU and the RAM, or and the um, yeah, and the and the, the RAM, uh, it won't boot. You know, it doesn't have anything on the firmware. So I'm going to plug that in, and then we're going to plug in the CPU. Now, like I said, we have additional boards on here that we're not going to use today. Um, I won't cover them today, but I will mention them. So here we have, um, this is of course the serial board. Behind that we have the CTC board. This is a uh, clock timer counter module. It's got the CTC chip installed in it. This is a PIO board, so parallel IO. And then this is a power board. This is actually the board that's providing, we're gonna, we plug in the power to this board and it, it handles power. It also has some outputs for power. Um, and yeah, 
So now we've got that all connected up. Now we need to connect our extension board. And on the extension board, we have a real time clock, which we're not gonna use. We have our, this is the original RC2014 uh, digital IO card. And then behind that is the original RC2014 compact flash card. We wanna plug it in. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah, that's a good connection. All right. So now it's all put together and we want to plug in the last component. Now, when we plug this in, this is going to take over or whichever, whichever is switched to. Again, earlier I said ROM when I switched down here, but actually it's RAM, treated as ROM. This is the ROM, the flash ROM, right? So this is gonna take the place of the ROM chip we just removed. It has small computer monitor on it and I will show you guys and gals and everyone in between how to use this card and use the small computer monitor to run the small computer monitor applications, which are a standard set of applications you can run on it, how to upload those to the system, how to upload your own firmware to the system, and how to run your own firmware. And we might try to cover a little bit about the Z180, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but it depends on how long this runs actually. So uh, we'll see. All right, we got everything plugged back in. So let's turn on the system. There we go. We now have small computer monitor showing up. Um, you can see that I can begin typing things. I'm gonna look at the help. You can see all the help stuff. Uh, devices, if I wanna see what devices are connected. It only detects some devices. You can see it detects the CF card at address 10, uh, port 10 rather, it detects the CTC card at port 88, it detects the SIO at port 80. You can see it has kind of various configurations that it could expect hardware to live at. But right now, um, you know, these are the ones it detects. The CF card living at 10 is actually kind of an old standard. Typically we we put it at 90 these days, but that's just a convention of the small computer central designs. Um, I only have one that addresses at 10, so uh, I can't change the, the address on that one, but I'll buy some more in the future and I'll set them to 90, which will require a different build of this uh, small computer monitor. Now, if I want to send some information to this thing, I can use my Minicom's send file ability. Now you can see we have various options to send file. I don't know what Kermit is, but X modem is pretty common on CPM in particular and uh, on DOS as well. And then, um, but we're gonna do ASCII. This only supports sending text files. So we wanna send ASCII text files. Now that doesn't mean that it's not software. Now I have a lot of stuff in here, but I'm gonna go to my small computer central source code. And one thing I'm gonna do is look at the application. So I have the main source code files here. This is small computer workshop and it's got small computer monitor source code in it. It's got builds in it. These are already pre-built. Normally you wouldn't keep binary files in a code base repository like this, but because this is designed as a distribution mechanism, the upstream author does indeed build these files. Now you'll see them as hex files only, so you'll want to convert them to bin. There is a, of course, a simple Python script that's available for most systems. For Linux, uh, for Windows, you can also get a file a converter called hex to bin. There's also bin to hex. You can convert back and forth between these formats pretty easily at the command line uh, on every operating system. So, you know, just look into that. You should find the commands pretty simply. Uh, they're all open source tools. So um, that being said, you can see I've turned a couple of these into, um, these are the actual firmwares themselves. I actually turn these into binary files and I've used them on various computers, but the small computer monitor directory here also contains applications that we can run. And some of those applications are interesting tests and demos and others are important tools. So one thing we can do is we can run the format compact flash directory. We can use the, or we can run the compact 
flash format if we have a compact flash that we want to install cpm 2.2 on we can use the uh oh look cpm install x modem uh, looks like i can install x modem on my cpm as well let's actually do that i want to do that so um these are for different systems we don't have a link 80 here link 80 is the design that created and standardized the z50 bus whereas rc2014 is the design that inspired the rc bus and we're going to load that because that's the most compatible computer that we're running uh, we're just selecting it with the the space bar and i'll hit enter if you're using TerraTerm on windows there's a drop down that says send text file now that's sent very fast all right now what it's going to do is now i can run it so when i send a file to this system it lands at address 8000 hexadecimal which is the first address of the upper 32k of ram now uh, i can press go to go to that address and run it now you can do oops you can do either um, binary or hexadecimal format or by itself go will always interpret the following number as hexadecimal right so now what's what this has done is it's a little application that loads a copy of download.com into memory uh, into RAM into a place in RAM where I can save it from onto my CPM now I already have CPM set up on my uh, flashcard so I which I used these apps to do so I can run CPM and then I can do the command it told me to run save to download.com and now when I check I have a download.com now this means that I can install various packages on the system using download.com now download.com also only accepts ascii files and it specifically requires a very specific binary format ascii format in order to work you will find packages that work for download.com on this site actually there is going to be if we go to projects and we go to small computer monitor we want to look at the latest revision of small computer monitor and then we can look at there's various configurations available for systems. There's a lot of different systems and configurations that this runs on, not just small computer central. So uh, you can look at the configurations. All the pre-built configurations are for SCC computers, but some of them are for uh, anything. There are configurations that you can build using the small computer workstation IDE, small computer workshop IDE. And... Um, and build your own for your own computer you can also of course modify the source code however you want uh, where do we look in here for our apps so we want to look at the apps specifically and one of the things we see is this is detailed instructions for loading SCM apps now I just showed you how to do that what we're going to do next is we're going to look at installing CPM now we have CPM installed already but one thing this shows us is a software library so if I go to this software library I can see that these are packages of software that have been created for this download com utility they are packaged up the way that they need to be packaged in order for that to work so say we want to play zork well we're going to download a copy of zork it's a zip file i already have a copy here so you can see that i've downloaded it and unzipped it it's like the second oven in a cooking show I've already cooked this thing um, and you can see the actual file itself is not a zip archive it is oh that's the wrong one that's not it that's a that's actually a completely different um, completely different copy of his work what we're looking for instead is here's planetfall let's look at planetfall you see this package.planetfall.txt this is the file we'll send so if i wanted to install planetfall now on cpm we have multiple drives each of them is seven megabytes i believe i think it's eight but you have access to seven um, and each drive is itself a little slice on the same physical media so this entire cf card has eight drives on it i believe a b c d e f g 
H and um, yeah, that's eight. So up to H from A to H and uh, you can switch between them and install stuff on various ones. So if I go to B, you can see I actually already have all these games installed, but if I wanted them on C instead, dir, you can see there's nothing in C. I can first change into the C directory and then I can send a copy of that file. So I want to send a file, send an ASCII file. We're going to look for this planet fall directory. Again, I got this from the same, from, from the same site here, uh, Small Computer Central's CPM software library. And of course, we can also package our own tools this way. I'll show you that in another video. So if, we, if we're making software for CPM, we can, we can build these packages ourselves and move them onto uh, systems with download.com. But we're going to go ahead and select the package and we're going to send it. You can see it automatically uses the download uh, file here. It knows that download it lives on the system somewhere. It finds it. It runs it. And it's uh, the download com file is actually responsible for placing the results into the directory. Now you see it's transferring, transferring. It's a game, so it's fairly large. It's going to be two files, a .com file for actually it's the actual executable and a .dat file for the game data. There we go. Now it always says cannot create lock file. That's not important. That's a mini com thing. Um, but now if we check the directory, which oh, we may have to reset it. Sometimes it locks up after that. So let's go back into CPM and then go to C and then check the directory. We have planetfall.dat. Actually, it failed. That transfer failed for some reason because we didn't get .com. So let's try that again. All right, so we just learned a valuable lesson here together, and that is that overclocking does not necessarily uh, allow you to stay compatible even if your serial line is clocked on its own clock because something about the overclock was causing the files to transfer too quickly, which meant that they were not completing the transfer for some reason, and I was getting errors that said file length error. So um, once I switch back to the regular clock, the seven point number I need to memorize clock, uh, everything started working again. So that's, that's my fault. Uh, it's the first time I actually attempted to do this process with the overclock enabled. Most everything else works with overclock enabled, but apparently serial communications uh, to CPM, there's some trouble. Now you'll notice that my um, SCM apps were working just fine. So it's actually a problem with download.com and download.com's expectation of what speed it's going to receive a text uh, file transfer at. And presumably it's because download.com is running on the CPU, which is clocked faster as opposed to simply receiving uh, raw data from the serial. It's actually receiving raw data from the serial and then attempting to process that data, and it's attempting to process it far too quickly, more quickly than it's designed to. So that seems to be what was causing that issue. It's a good lesson to learn. Uh, not the best lesson to learn on video, but at least we all know it now. So now if I wanted to check out what's going on. Now I actually, in my testing, I actually, uh, took everything apart, put everything together, and uh, redid the install of, um, redid the install of, why do I have a blank file here? Oh, that's probably because I was sending files to it while it was still overclocked. Yeah, but I did the reinst I did a reinstall of CPM and everything. So actually, I think I'm gonna walk through that whole process right now because we just ran into so many problems. So let's go ahead and start from scratch. So let's assume I have a blank, a completely blank compact flash card that we want to install CPM onto. We're loaded into a small computer monitor. We can see with devices that we have our CF card. It's detectable. 
well, it's t it's blank or it's got something on it. It's it doesn't it's not ready for CPM yet. Now we want to prepare it for CPM. We want to start sending some files. We want to send some of these SCM apps. So first, we're going to send the SCM app called uh, Format CF Flash. Now you'll see I happen to have a copy of it here. SCM CF Format Code 800. This this happens to be here because I've been working with it a lot, so uh, I, I've placed it here. But I pulled it from outside the uh, small computer works uh, workshop uh, code base. Now it's already ready. Now we want to go and to address 8000 hex. Uh, you can see it's it's telling me it's going to erase all the data from the card. Do you want to continue? It sees that it's 128 megabytes. The problem we were having was definitely not a space issue on the card, as I had guessed, or during my troubleshooting, guessing. Um, all right, now we've got that formatted, so it's time to send the next piece of code. We want to, now when we send this next piece of code, it's gonna overwrite the code we just sent. So we're still gonna jump to address 8000 hex because that's where it's gonna be living at. But in this case, we want this put sys plus. Um, you can see that this one actually has some very specific settings. It's for the RC2014 style, which is what this system is. It's for Z80 as opposed to Z180. It's for an SIO at the port address 80 hex. And it's set for CF card at the address 10 hex, which is 16 decimal. Um, that is at 10 hex, which is the old kind of RC2014 standard, and it happens to be what my uh, CF card module is addressed to, is hard-coded to on, on the module. All right, so we're gonna select that one, and we're gonna place it. Now when we run this, what it's gonna do is it's gonna install a very bare bones uh, CPM system, just kind of the CPM kernel with you know the command line interface and nothing else. It, the formatter has already taken care of formatting the drives. We're gonna to go to 8,000 hex, and it's very fast. You can see system transfer complete. It's already got CPM, and I can boot CPM now, right? This is the install of CPM that I just installed. If I had tried to run the CPM command before that, the computer will just hang if there's no CPM available on the CF card. Now we wanna start sending, well, now we don't have anything. We don't even have our download dot com file so uh, if we want to do that we need to restart the system go back into a monitor let's send another file this is the last piece of code we have to send to get cpm up and fully functional right so we want to send the we did put sys we did uh we, we need to do download so you saw me attempt to install this early earlier i called it x modem it was actually an older version of, of the correct X modem and um, of the correct download com as opposed to X modem. I don't know why it was called X modem, but um, first we'll go ahead and go to the, oops, I did up instead of, go to SCM monitor, go to apps, and what we want is this CPM install download. You saw this was the one I attempted to download earlier. And, it, I looked at it and it's actually the same thing as this. I thought I was going to get a copy of X modem, which is different from download.com, but uh, that was misleading. So uh, there we go. So we're still in small computer monitor. So we want to go to the hex 8000 address. Now what this has done is I said this earlier, it placed a copy of download.com into memory in a place where the save command is gonna understand how to get to it once we're in CPM. So we're in CPM, the memory hasn't changed uh, from then, so we're gonna to save to download com. And because we're in the A drive, we get it in the A drive. Now we can start sending packages. You'll notice we don't have any of the standard uh, CPM tools right now. If You may have saw earlier when I was on the finished installation. Well, download com and that package file format that we were looking at is the same way that we install the applications. So we'll send another file. 
we have to stay, it works, the sending files works the same way, but, uh, or at least in terms of how we send it. We still wanna send an ASCII text file. We don't wanna send a binary. Um, later on, we may look at an actual XCOM install where you can send any kind of file arbitrarily. Uh, but as download.com works, it comes, pulls over the serial line and it expects ASCII characters. Once it starts getting binary characters, it's gonna start trying to interpret commands and that's a problem. So we have install download already set up. We have our download com already. Now I pulled these packages from here. This is this is this package. It's installing pip, which is how we transfer files. It's peripheral interchange program. It, it's, it's essentially a copy program. Uh, ed, that's our editor. ASM, we have an assembler, assembly language assembler. All right, now we have all our tools. And if we wanna install our games, we can change to a drive. We can install them on A as well, but if you wanna keep things separate, you will typically change to a drive. Plus, you know, we only have, I think, seven megabytes per uh, drive slice is what it's called. So. Uh, you know, we want to make sure we're spreading out the load. All right, so let's go ahead and send our Zork. Now we changed to B. The, the program still knows how to find the download com, but it's going to download directly to whatever drive you're in. So you want to change to the directory that you want the software to land in. There we go. It works this time because we we didn't attempt to overclock it. Yay, Zork works. And I own uh, all the Infocom games except maybe a couple that, of obscure ones. Uh, I own the whole collection of, of Infocom games for DOS, so I have actually all the physical documentation I need to play this game effectively. And I've actually played pretty far on this machine. Uh, I still haven't beaten this game, it's rough. And I'm, I'm hesitant to open the hint manual that will kind of get me past some of the blockers. I, I kind of want to figure it out on my own. So uh, yeah, that's cool. I really like this. This is, uh, the game is a little different on DOS. There's kind of more features on DOS. Like it will show you your score in the top as you play. And I've actually noticed some difference in behavior in the troll room. Uh, that seems, it's random behavior, but um, there seem to be more actions that the troll can take in the troll room. Uh, but yeah, we will exit that, quit, yes. And of course we can save, we can, it'll make a little save, dot save file, dot sav. All right, well that's pretty much it for the basics of how to use small computer monitor. Now we want to start getting into the advanced topics of how to use the developer firmware kit card, the developer firmware module I have to actually do something different. All right, so one of the key features, reset, one of the key features of this um, card is that when when you're working with the flash ROM, if you write to the lower 32K of memory, which I've mentioned, then instead of write, attempting to write to the flash ROM, it will write to the RAM. And when you flip that switch, it'll swap out the RAM and ROM so that you have that RAM in the lower 32K. So you can write whatever you want to it, switch it out, reset it and run something else. Now I happen to have uh, a operating system that I've been using on these for a long time called Collapse OS. It's not my operating system. Uh, it is a, a community effort led by a man named Virgil Dupra. I hope I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing that last name correctly. And uh, 
I have my own fork of it that I use. It now, Collapse OS has become Dusk OS, which is a whole different thing. It's still it's still Collapse OS under the hood, but it's not. Um, It's not the same thing. It's not maintained the same way. It's not targeting the same systems. And so I'm at this point now where I'm using kind of the final release before the Dusk OS releases of Collapse OS for the Z80 platform and specifically the RC2014 platform, which this computer is compatible with. And um, I'm using that as my kind of foundation for making my own changes to the operating system, which I need to make a lot. I can't even use the whole thing yet because I'm missing a, a piece of hardware that I need to actually use a file system with it. Or I need to implement my own support for CF cards, which is, uh, both are difficult. So we'll get there though. Um, we want to go to the Z80 Arch RC2014. Now this is my own, um, my own branch here that I have for Small Computer Central. It has some specific changes in it. I've changed the make file to allow me to build my own OS with loader hex. Now I'm gonna just go ahead and run make. It'll just go ahead and make everything actually. Let's clean all make. It's building the operating system using its own built-in tools and a little extra uh, syntax sugar that I added. Not, sh no, It's not really syntax sugar, but a little extra features I added. And it's giving me this file, os.bin, uh, loader.bin, and os with loader.bin. Now, this particular computer has pageable ROM RAM. Just besides just the fact that I'm using the developer, firmware developer card that lets me switch between ROM and RAM, I can, without that card and with it, I can write to a specific port, port hexadecimal 38. And if I write a one to it, it swaps out the bottom 32K with 32K of RAM living on the board itself, uh, living on the, on the um, memory module board. And when you do that, you have to have that RAM prepared with something to run or else the system will just stop. Now, in order to run CPM, you need to have that set up because CPM, what CPM does is it will copy, it'll make a copy of itself. It has a little bootloader and that bootloader makes a copy of itself and CPM in high memory. And then it causes, the, it jumps to a location in high memory, then swaps out the, it does the page, swaps out the RAM and ROM, and then it copies the, the rest of CPM back into the beginning of RAM and then it jumps back to the beginning of RAM. And that's exactly what this loader does. If we look at it, this is literally the same exact code as what is used to launch the CPM with paged memory. So what we're doing is we're making a little, we're starting at zero, we're making a little space here. We're um, taking 32K of memory starting at zero, and we're placing it at the 32K. And then we're gonna just jump straight there. Now this copy includes all of this code. So when we jump to 8,012, we actually end up right here on this line of code. And you can see this runs from 8,013 hex. So we give ourselves a no op just in case, just to give a little time and then we turn, we load A, we page out the memory by writing that one bit to 38, which will swap the RAM and ROM. Now, at present, the memory is still at 8,000 something hex, and it continues on, it does the copy. It says, all right, from 27, which is where this file ends when it's in binary format, all the way to the end of memory, copy all the way, all of that back to zero, and then jump to zero. And what that does is it takes, it puts a copy of the operating system into the high RAM, pages it out, places that same copy back into low RAM, jumps to low RAM, and then you have a full 64K of RAM, some of which is occupied by the, boot, by the firmware itself. 
And that's what we're doing here. So we have OS with loader dot hex, which is what we're going to send to our to our computer. Uh, OS with loader dot bin is its first stage. I use the script, the Python script hex to bin or bin to hex to convert between them. I actually concatenate. I just straight up concatenate the loader dot bin and the OS dot bin together to generate this file. And then I convert that file with the Python command. And then we can send it, right? So the thing is, because we know that this starts at org zero, the hex file, it contains all the code. Actually, let's look at it. OS with loader dot hex. This is a representation of what would normally be machine language. And one thing you'll notice about it is at the very top, is at the very left, there are these addresses. These numbers are addresses. Less. The very so this represents where in memory these bits of code are gonna lie. And this system knows how to interpret that so that it reads, okay, where am I gonna place this? Well, I'm gonna place it at zero. So it's gonna automatically write to the bottom 32K of memory, which as we know is gonna write to that RAM module that we can then switch to. So if I go ahead and send ASCII, oh, I wanna to go to Collapse OS, but we're gonna to go to Source. Nope, that's the wrong one. Here's my file. I'm going to load it up. It's already done. It's a very small file. And then I'm going to switch to Flash, or away from Flash. And then I'm going to reset the system. Boom, Collapse OS OK. There we go. And now I can do Collapse OS things. All right, I've added two numbers in what is essentially reverse Polish notation. Um, I'm not that skilled with Collapse OS despite using it for years, and it's largely because I, like I said, I have to, uh, I'm missing some features as a result of not knowing how to modify it to support CF cards yet. Somewhere I'm, I'm getting there. And also not having a spy relay um, device, which is how Collapse OS by default implements a file system on an SD card, where the rest of its code needs to live so that you can do things like cross-compiling, compiling assembly language, um, some C language stuff, uh, and various other development processes. But right now, I'm in a place where I can um, look at here. Now here normally would start at uh, 8,000 hexadecimal, but you'll see it starts at 2,000 hexadecimal, which is the, uh, it normally would be part of the read-only memory, but because we used a bootloader, to do the paging section, I have a full access to all the memory. And because the firmware itself only takes up about 19 something hex of space, I can start at two at 2000 hex. I could actually start at like 1968 hex or something like that if I wanted to. But that's a weird non round number that I didn't want to mess with. And I do plan to extend the base firmware further. So I don't expect that I'll be able to start this early in the RAM moving forward. But yeah, that being said, um, this will stay in memory through reset after reset until you turn the system off. To swap to ROM, uh, you can consider the RAM. Sometimes you'll switch back and it'll, it'll still be working, but just consider the RAM to be corrupted at that point um, and then resend your code. You can resend it. All right. So now we know how we can use that to develop our own firmware, test it without having to pull the flash memory card each time and, and updating the flash memory card each time. Instead, we can send it to the system over serial. So this saves us a few things. Like, first of all, we're not risking our chips by pulling them in and out of sockets all the time. 
We're also not wearing them out too quickly by rewriting them all the time. And if you have a zero insertion force um, socket on your memory module, you know, that's fine. You don't, you're, you're risking not breaking, but you're still writing to your, to your disk a lot. And each of these flash chips, you know, they have a finite lifespan. They can only be written to a certain amount of times. They could probably outlive us, some of them, but, uh, you know, if you're doing firmware development, you might find yourself burning out chips here and there. All right, so here's our ROM WBW computer. It runs a Z180 processor at 18 megahertz-ish. Another number I should memorize, 18 point some, 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 some. Um, it has two... Uh, optional ROMs, one of which has ROM WBW on it, one of which has small computer monitor on it. It has a good amount of RAM. This is essentially a Z80 with a slightly larger of address space uh, in with a memory memory management unit inside. Um, it really only understands 64K of address at a time, but there is sort of a, a base you can page in about a megabyte of memory space. I, I think exactly a me megabyte is what you can address with a Z Z180. Um, and then uh, it's also got some built-in peripherals. It's got its own built-in serial serial line. It doesn't use the same SIO. It uses something called ASCII, uh, A-S-C-I, the uh, Asynchronous Serial Communication Interface, I believe it stands for. And it also, um, but it, it works the same way. It's it's pretty much just different address ports for setting it up and stuff. But we don't even have to mess with that because our operating system does all that for us. All right, we'll take a look at ROM WBW, uh, what it looks like and how we can use it to do the same kinds of things that we did on our other system. Okay, so you'll see that I'm not as kind of familiar with, uh, with ROM WBW yet. So... It may take me a little bit to get up to speed here, but we'll go ahead and turn this system on. Ooh, ooh. Now we're connecting through the same serial terminal line, like I just used the same device, so we're still in the same terminal session, uh, at least Minicom session. That's not important. So you can see this, this boots up and it looks a little different than the other one. Uh, we want to see what help we have. Now this is, I believe, an older version of Small Computer Monitor. Small Computer SC, blah, 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 blah. No, this is part of ROM, this is the ROM WBW bootloader, which is different from Small Computer Monitor, written by a different team and everything. Um, it behaves similarly though, uh, but it's just a bootloader, it's not a monitor. You can see there's no disassembler, there's no Anything like that. We can look at devices though. See our device inventory. That's interesting. Yeah, it sees our SD card, see? Uh, but that's what this is. It, it printed this device inventory to begin with, just as part of boot. We can reboot the system. We can change. Ooh, it's very interesting. This is a good place to change interfaces and baud rates. If I wanted to be using uh, the, the port B instead of port A, for example, or if I wanted a different speed for our transfer rates, uh, boot unit slice. Uh, I guess that's for detecting, for like determining which of these pieces of media is the boot media, uh, but we're not gonna mess with that. So for now, we're gonna look at uh, the list of ROMs. Now we have multiple options here. We can run fourth, we can run basic, multiple versions of basic. One of my favorite things is to play the game. I love the fact that there's a network boot that's really useful for firmware development. Um, looks like we have 2048 here. This is a fun game. I like to think I'm pretty good at this game, but I'm probably not. In any case, we can quit to exit, yes. So it's cool, it's got little Easter eggs and everything. So uh, we want to list list these. There's a couple different, there's CPM 2.2, which I was wrong to say that it doesn't support it. I thought it was CPM 3. Typically you will see CPM 3 here. Then there's Z system, which is like CPM, but it's, it's kind of newer, it's still maintained. It's 
updated regularly. And I tend to prefer Z system. Z system is said to not be compatible with some of the retro software out there. So CPM 2.2 is included primarily to make sure that people who want to do retro computing can run their old software on it. For me and a lot of others like me, we're less interested in retro computing and we're more interested in modern computing on 8-bit equipment, which is a whole different monster. We're not necessarily trying to run just old software. We're not necessarily trying to just recreate what it was like back in the day. We're really trying to write new software and new useful use cases for these pieces of equipment. For, for the most part, 8-bit computing is most useful as an education tool because uh, all the concepts that apply to 8-bit compute, they also apply to 32-bit compute and they apply to 64-bit compute and they apply to 128-bit compute and so on and so forth. So everything you can learn on an 8-bit computer will translate into technical understanding of every other type of computer platform out there. And that's kind of the best use case for 8-bit right now. But as scarcity starts to intensify and super high performance uh, CPU chips become less and less available, uh, I think it's going to be more and more important that there are people like us out there working on new software for 8-bit computing systems and 16-bit computing systems and things that are easy to manufacture for chip developers. All right, that being said, I'll get off my soapbox and we'll take a look at what's in here. Now, we have a lot of stuff in here. Uh, these are all just things that came with the system. And one of the interesting things that I want to show you is that we have access to the FAT32 file system. Now, we have to give ourselves this ability by installing a tool. And I happen to have that tool installed already. This command... Now, the, the operating system doesn't understand the FAT32 file, FAT file system on its own. It's, it's not going to let you mount it the way it would on a Windows system or a Linux system. Instead, we use this tool to talk to the FAT32 file system and to transfer things between the FAT32 file system and the CPM file system uh, that we see. So we can't, if we want to actually look at, um, well, let's take a look. First, let's take a look at the command. The command is going to give us some options. So you can see this is just a command line utility that we use. To, it's literally a command line tool that we use to talk to the FAT file system. So if I want to see what lives on a FAT file system. Now I happen to know this is drive four because I set it up. Look, I have Zork stuff on there. Cool. I have Zork one, two, and three on there. I did, I have that on there because I used it to transfer those games onto my B drive or well, actually my C drive. Well, no, where did I put it? A is a RAM disc on this one. B is where things live. C is where this lives. Oh, I guess I didn't put those games on here. D, dir. oh no, they're here, okay. So if I wanted to copy these, say I wanted another copy of these in E. There's nothing here. Then I can use the fat command line on C, copy for, I'm just gonna copy everything on four over to E. Now you might say, oh, so what? You have FAT32 file system. Well, the point of this is that we can transfer things using sneaker net now. We can take the SD card out of here, plug it into a computer, a modern computer, uh, mount that FAT file system, put things onto it, and then we can use this command line tool to transfer things onto the system. Now there is another way to transfer things onto the system, and that is via X modem, because we do get X modem here. We don't have that download.com utility. Instead, we have X modem, which is actually a little bit more robust, because instead of just accepting text files, you can send any kind of binary file you want, any kind of data that you want. I'm gonna erase these files because I don't actually want them on my E drive, yes. There they are, you can see that they're gone. 
and now say I wanted to install one from from serial well first of all I need to go to I need to run X mode and you want to run this first because um, you the system may lock up in such a way as you can't interact with the command line once you start sending a file until you've sent the file so you want to run this first and then send the file and you can see that if we want to receive a file we can name it exactly what we want so I can run X modem receive zork1 com boom oh now I made a mistake here you still have to address the correct drive when you're calling a command that lives on that drive all right, now it's waiting ready to receive all right now I can send a file okay now I can send it but I want to make sure I'm sending with X modem all right here we go now X modem will communicate and send the binary file and now we can see we have the com. Now I can do the same thing for dat. B XM R sort one dot dat. Make sure we do X modem. Zork. All right. Uh, that's all we're going to cover today. That's kind of as far as I've gotten. Um, this video has been long overdue because partially. I'm not skilled enough. Uh, I, it's taken me years to get to the point where I can do this much and also teach it. So uh, I've kind of reached the point where I'm starting to make real progress on the software side of these things. So you should expect to see more videos demystifying how to use these computers coming soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time. Hope you enjoyed it. Peace.